You're listening to the FQXI podcast. Today. The way that we can reconcile that notion with the notion of uh, temperature below absolute zero is that if a system has a temperature below absolute zero, it's actually hotter than it could possibly be at any positive temperature. Quantum steampunk. There's this wonderful blend of old and new that creates a sense of both nostalgia and adventure and romance. I see quantum thermodynamics as very much sharing this spirit of steampunk. Physicist Nicole Younger Halpin talks about her new book on the physics of yesterday's tomorrow. Thermodynamics was developed because people were wondering how efficiently engines could pump water out of mines. So conventional thermodynamics was very closely coupled to the industrial revolution that involves this practical mindset. We might similarly hope to couple quantum thermodynamics to the second quantum revolution, in which we're using quantum systems uh, to achieve technological advantages. I'm Zia Morali. Welcome to the podcast from the Foundational Questions Institute, where today we have a special treat, an in-depth chat with quantum physicist and FQXI member Nicole Younger-Halpern of the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Maryland. Nicole has recently published a book, Quantum Steampunk, The Physics of Yesterday's Tomorrow, with Johns Hopkins University Press. So this is a real pleasure. I first met you, Nicole, a few years ago at a meeting, I don't know if you remember this, at Cambridge University in England, organised by FQXI's own Ian Durham. Likewise. And it was a meeting attended by some quite illustrious figures, and you were a PhD student at the time, if I recall correctly. Yes. So one thing I remember very clearly is that after every talk, your hand would shoot up and you'd always come up with some truly profound question or insight that would stump the speaker. (laughs) And I have to say, it quickly became apparent to everyone in the room that, um, that you were one of the smartest people in the room, which is not at all common for a graduate student. Well, that is quite the confident boost. (laughs) I I could use it. I I appreciate it. (laughs) I'm going somewhere with this, I should say. It's not just flattery. I was there as a journalist, and what I realized was that you were extremely passionate about your research topic, which was at that time in a largely unknown area called quantum thermodynamics. So this is the field in which people try to see how the laws of thermodynamics need to be extended or modified or tweaked when they're applied in the quantum realm. And I think that was the first time that I had ever heard of this term. Since then, I've written about it a lot. Our listeners have heard about it a lot because FQXI currently has a massive grant round running on information as fuel. But it's still a relatively new frontier. It's still a bit of a niche topic even now. So let me ask you, how did you start working on this as a student? There are many different routes to that answer. So the answer has its roots in many different places. One is in high school, I learned about thermodynamics from a biology class. And it struck me as interesting because it's a very abstract concept. And then the next year I took physics for the first time and my classmates and I all had to undertake projects that were somehow related to energy. So some people studied wind energy, some people studied solar energy, some people studied nuclear energy, and I had to be the weird kid who went for the laws of thermodynamics. Very abstract, very theoretical. But they fascinated me because even though they are abstract and theoretical, they are so extremely fundamental to understanding our universe. They help us understand why time flows in one direction. What is more fundamental than that? And I'm especially intrigued, and I've long been intrigued by entropy. There are many different types of entropies, but they tend to have similar mathematical forms. And this mathematical form is kind of odd. Like you take a probability and you use it twice together with a a logarithm and you have a negative sign out front and maybe you have a sum. There are good reasons why entropies tend to have this form. Um, But still, it's an entropy is a funny looking object. And it's kind of odd to think that this abstract idea 
which has this strange mathematical form, is so fundamental to our universe. I love the intersection of quantum information and thermodynamics because they both have the flavor of this entropy. They're both fundamental and foundational. Uncertainty and information and entropy are important to both. And in addition to being fundamental, they have the possibility of practical applications. Certainly quantum information has been shown to have practical applications in computing and sensing and cryptography and so on. And we're hoping that quantum thermodynamics, in addition to having the fundamental impact that we've seen over the past few years and shedding new light on our understanding of energy and time and information, will also have some applications to technologies. So I've just been fascinated by this intersection for many years because I've had kind of a philosophical bent always. And I just increasingly from high school through really through my master's degree, increasingly homed in on this intersection is where I really wanted to be. I always ask people who are working in quantum thermodynamics about the practical and technological applications, and I'm going to come to that with you a bit later. But what struck me while I was reading your book is that you are very much a theorist. Absolutely. And you have an equal amount of love for the quantum part of your research, the thermodynamics side, and the information theory side. You know, from the journalist's view, we're usually most excited about the weird quantum stuff. But you bring out the fun and the wonder in all of these aspects, which was a lot of fun to read. But let me ask you now about the structure of the book. Funnily enough, I was reading your book at the same time as Chiara Marletto's The Science of Canon Kant, which was featured in April on the podcast. And both books deal with similar ideas, similar topics about um, quantum physics and information and thermodynamics. And superficially, they sort of have a similar structure. And yet they are completely different reads. One thing you both have in common is that you both start your chapters with an enchanting fictional snippet. Actually, when I started reading your book, I thought, you know, I I was enjoying those bits of fiction so much. And you're kind of building up a whole narrative with these characters throughout the book. You know, I was thinking, you know, I wish she'd just written the whole book as fiction. (laughs) I think there's a novel inside you screaming to get out. Why did you decide to write the book in this style? If any literary agents happen to read this book and would like to suggest that I propose a steampunk novel, then I would be interested in hearing from them. (laughs) Well, let's hope they are listening. But tell us more about the fictional story that you weave through the book. Yeah, at the beginning of each chapter is a little snippet from an imaginary steampunk novel that lives in my imagination. And for any readers who aren't familiar with steampunk, this is a genre of science fiction. It's a genre of literature, art, and film. And it features Victorian settings, men in top hats and women in full skirts, and some of the earliest factories, the Industrial Revolution, smoggy London, and also the Wild Wild West and Meiji Japan together with futuristic technologies like time machines, dirigibles, and automata. There's this wonderful blend of old and new that creates a sense of both nostalgia and adventure and romance. And I see quantum thermodynamics as very much sharing this spirit of steampunk. Thermodynamics was developed during the 1800s, during the Industrial Revolution, during the Victorian era. Meanwhile, quantum information is cutting edge technology and to some extent futuristic technology because we don't yet have full-scale quantum computers. So this blend of old and new I see in both steampunk and quantum thermodynamics, which is why I like to call quantum thermodynamics quantum steampunk. So each chapter begins with a snippet from an imaginary quantum steampunk novel. And I started toying with this idea when I wrote an article for Scientific American that came out in spring 2020 about quantum steampunk. I thought it would be fun to start off the article with uh, a little story about some character walking the streets of dark Victorian London at night and seeing, looking up and seeing some dirigible, some futuristic technology that is being piloted by the evil villain in the story. And as I wrote the book, I increasingly had fun with this idea because steampunk does have some 
some elements that sometimes come up again and again, like the very spunky girl who refuses to be fettered by the expectations of Victorian society and corsets and so on and so forth and is very adventurous. You can even see this in some of the movies that have come out recently, like Enola Holmes and a recent Disney movie that featured Dwayne Johnson. I find it kind of fun to play with those conventions and kind of put them into the story so that we can smile at them. But also I found it useful to include these snippets because they could introduce some characters that would then play roles in explaining the nonfiction that forms the bulk of each chapter. In information processing, especially in quantum information science, we often explain how we can use quantum resources or how we can perform information processing tasks like sending information down a noisy channel by telling a story in terms of some characters. Alice wants to send a message to Bob or Alice throws a diary into a black hole and Bob collects Hawking radiation to try to find out what the secret was. And then there's an eavesdropper Eve who tries to eavesdrop on Alice's message in cryptography protocols. And we've heard about Alice and Bob so very much, I thought it's not necessary to tote them out yet again in this book, so let's use instead Victorian characters called Audrey and Baxter. They have a friend, Caspian, who plays the role of Charlie in Information Theoretic Protocols, and there's an evil villain, Ewart, who tries to eavesdrop on Audrey and Baxter and Caspian. Ewart plays the role of Eve in information theoretic protocols. So I, I really enjoyed playing with the idea of the novel and the book, even though most of the book is nonfiction. So I actually have a standard set of questions that I ask everyone working on quantum thermodynamics. Go for it. But in your case, I also have a weird and unique list of questions. <laughs> I'm going to read out some of the terms that I underlined to ask you about to our readers. And I think just the fact that these are the terms that I've highlighted will give readers a sense of the playful tone of your book. So I've got what in tarnation are temperatures below absolute zero, <laughs> which I'm quoting straight from your book. I've got the word Yorkie Cocker Sheepapoo. Ah, yes. And I've made a note that I really have to ask you because you mention it at some point, but you don't quite elaborate in the book. What were the four most memorable advertisements you received from colleges while in junior high school. <laughs> so let's turn first to the temperatures below absolute zero question. <laughs> what is a temperature below absolute zero? That idea does seem counterintuitive because we are taught that if a system is at absolute zero temperature, then it cannot possibly get any colder. And that's true. The way that we can reconcile that notion with the notion of uh, temperature below absolute zero is that if a system has a temperature below absolute zero, it's actually hotter than it could possibly be at any positive temperature. And the key behind this idea of negative temperatures is negative temperatures are only available to systems that can have only so many configurations. For instance, uh, quantum system has only certain energy levels available to it. The quantum literally means a discrete packet of something. And so a quantum system can have only discrete values for its energy. For instance, suppose that we have an electron. An electron has a property called spin, which is kind of similar to angular momentum. And if we put this electron in a magnetic field, then loosely speaking, there are just two different energies that this electron can have if we are focusing on a very simple model. So the electron has a very limited set of energies available to it. Now suppose that we have a collection of electrons and suppose that we put them all in their lowest energy states so that the system has a temperature of zero. Now this isn't actually completely possible because of one of the laws of thermodynamics but we can actually get systems pretty close to zero temperature. So we start off with a really, really cold system, and then we shine a light on our electrons. So some of the electrons will absorb photons, packets of light. So these electrons start to get a little bit of energy. So some of the electrons will go from their lower energy levels to their upper energy levels. And as we shine more and more lights, the electrons will absorb more and more energy, and more of the electrons will come up to their upper energy levels. So we can keep doing this, and as we 
increase the total amount of energy in the system, we are increasing the temperature. Then at some point, half of the electrons will be in their upper energy level and half of the electrons will be in their lower energy level. Now it turns out that at this point, the system is at infinite temperature. So infinite temperature really just means the whole global system, all of the electrons are in there, the middle of the set of possible energies. And this is because a temperature is actually the rate of change of energy with entropy. And entropy is a measure of how many different configurations are accessible to the system. So if we increase the energy further, we add more and more photons, we pump more and more electrons to their upper levels, then it turns out that the temperature becomes negative. So as the system gains more and more energy, the temperature becomes negative. This is explained more fully in the book, but it's because of the relationship between energy and entropy. And it's because uh, a quantum system has a finite set of states allowed to it because each electron has just two energy levels available to it. That's why a quantum system can reach a negative temperature. So your book is full of these glorious counterintuitive ideas. And what I love is that you are able to describe these things very rigorously, as you just did. I've also written about temperatures below absolute zero in the past for nature. And I'll put a link to that article and all the research that we chat about on the podcast page, fqxi.org slash community slash podcast. And of course, I'll put a link to your book, Quantum Steampunk. I've also written an in-depth feature for Nature about the history and development of quantum thermodynamics. And for that, I went back to about the 1980s. But in your book, when you talk about the history, you go back to the 1950s. I genuinely didn't realise it had such deep roots. So can you talk a bit more about how sort of the quantum thermodynamics field started to develop and you know, when it became much more popular in the wider community. Yes. So basically, as soon as a physicist developed quantum theory, they started thinking about the possible relationship between quantum theory and thermodynamics. So if I recall correctly, it was really during the 1930s that the first papers came out about whether the uncertainty inherent in quantum theory has anything to do with the uncertainty and entropy in thermodynamics. And I'm grateful for some pointers in this direction from Jean Paolo Beretta, who participated in one of the waves of quantum thermodynamics that is before the most recent one, uh, although (laughs) far after the 1930s wave. During the 1950s and 60s, people started thinking about the first quantum engines. And these were designed to consist of single atoms that would act as masers, which are like lasers, except they emit microwave radiation instead of visible light. So some folks showed that if you have a maser, then you can actually operate it as a heat engine and take advantage of the fact that your atom is a quantum system, so it can interact with an environment that has a negative temperature, so it can get a little extra out of the engine cycle than a classical engine might be able to. Then during the 1980s, there was actually quite a bit of work. Jean Paolo Beretta is someone I know who was operative during that era and belonged to a cohort of faculty members at MIT who worked on quantum thermodynamics. They took a very abstract theoretical perspective, thinking about reformulating the laws of thermodynamics. And also around that time period, There were some really important mathematical developments, for instance, by people who studied master equations, which are mathematical descriptions of how a system interacts with its environment, for instance, by exchanging energy with its environment. And we use a lot of those results about master equations nowadays. Also, Seth Lloyd was writing his famous PhD thesis about Maxwellian demons and black holes. Then there was a somewhat quieter period for a couple of decades, although Ilya Prigogine was in charge of what's called the Prigogine School, which thought about non-equilibrium thermodynamics, including quantum thermodynamics. But there is, has been recently a very energetic wave that has arisen. It started, as you said, maybe around the time I started my PhD, it's especially had a great deal of energy to start with in Europe. 
there was a large grant that was awarded to a European collaboration to support quantum thermodynamics. So Janet Anders and uh, Renato Renner are some people who are involved in the leadership of that grant and that funded a lot of projects and a lot of students and I felt like I was one of the very few people in the United States who was participating in that world. There was also activity in Canada and Singapore and Israel. I should also mention that Israel has had quantum thermodynamic activity across many, many years. Then that surge in activity during the 2010s led to a number of really cool insights, including some high impact publications, a set of conferences, and a quantum thermodynamics community. Also, during this time period, quantum experiments came to be quite sophisticated, and quantum thermodynamics, which had long been extremely theoretical, began drawing connections with experiments and partnering with experimentalists. I think that partnering with experimentalists and some of these impactful publications helped convince people in the rest of the world that quantum thermodynamics was something to pay attention to. Also, a few colleagues and I have worked to bridge quantum thermodynamics to other disciplines that are nearby in which people do care about energy, information, and quantum theory, but wouldn't consider themselves quantum thermodynamics and their community has been traditionally somewhat divorced from our community. So we've increasingly tried to build bridges from quantum thermodynamics to atomic molecular and optical physics, chemistry, condensed matter, and high energy theory. So I think that also those connections have helped quantum thermodynamics become more widely recognized globally. Now I've got to come back to the term Yorkie Cocker Sheepapoo that you have coined. <laughs> you don't need to define it completely because it brings together a lot of complex ideas and people should go away and read your book to find out more about what it actually refers to. But I wanted to bring it up because you use it to illuminate something that has struck me as a writer when I've been talking to researchers in this field. And that is that there seem to be so many definitions flying around and new definitions and redefinitions often, you know, using the same words. So I have a background in physics coming from cosmology and I thought I knew what a lot of these terms in thermodynamics mean and what they refer to. But sometimes it seems like physicists using the same terms in quantum thermodynamics are talking about subtly different things, and sometimes this means that they end up talking at cross purposes. Can you talk about how difficult it is as a theorist to try and work out new laws that apply to thermodynamics on the quantum scale and to define and redefine some very complicated and subtle concepts? Sure. So one of the great challenges in quantum thermodynamics is to come up with useful definitions of quantum heat and work. Heat and work are the two types of energy that can be transferred between systems. We think of heat as random energy that comes from the random jiggling of excited particles. It's uncoordinated, so it's not directly useful. In contrast, work is well-ordered energy. It's coordinated. You can directly harness it to do something like push a rock up a hill or charge a battery or power a car. We have definitions of work and heat that we are presented with in our undergraduate thermodynamics classes. And then we have to translate those into the quantum regime. In order to say that we've defined something as physicists, we tend to need to specify how we can measure this thing. The measurements are sometimes used as a line that you have to reach to indicate that you have established something that's real and physical. The problem is, in order to measure the work done on a system, we will tend to measure a system's energy before work is done, and then measure the system's energy after the work is done, and then say the difference between the two energies is the work performed on the system. However, in the quantum regime, if we measure a system, then we will tend to disturb it. And so if we measure systems energy, then we can actually change how much energy that system has. 
And so we can change the amount of work that's done on the system or the amount of heat that's absorbed by the system. So it seems as though in order to figure out how much work or heat is absorbed, we have to change the amount of work or heat is absorbed. And so how do we get around that puzzle? As you said, many people have come up with many different definitions of quantum work and heat. If I actually have a file, every time that I find another definition of quantum work and heat, I add the associated paper to the file. And I call the file the menagerie of quantum work and heat. So that's why you mentioned the Yorki Kakashipapu definition. I think of all of the different definitions of work and heat as different species in a zoo of definitions. And so in the book there, as I go through some of the definitions, I associate them with different animals. And one of them is a kind of artificial animal that we can make up in our imaginations. And that's why I call it Yorki Kakashipapu, because that's a, a made up artificial sort of animal. I have not put forth myself any definitions for quantum work and heat, because I find that different definitions out there are useful for different contexts. So I have the sense, and I believe that other people in the community have the sense, that there won't be just one definition of quantum work and heat that will emerge as the victor over all of the definitions, and only this definition will be used in the future. I think that different definitions suit different contexts. How we define work and heat depends on what we want to do to our system, what sort of setup we have, and how we can poke our system and how we can measure our system. This way of thinking contrasts quite a bit with a type of thinking that is very closely associated with theoretical physicists, the obsession with unification. Particle physicists are often portrayed as trying to unify everything in sight. I do agree that it is a very interesting and worthwhile challenge to try to put together the different theories of the different forces that we know of to try to create a grand unified theory of them all. However, I'm not sure that that is the right approach for quantum thermodynamics. Maybe quantum thermodynamics in some sense is richer in that it seems to call for definitions that all share somehow the same spirit. You know, work is useless, random, uncoordinated energy. A work is useful, coordinated energy. But the different definitions suit different purposes and setups, and especially different operational abilities, different skills and tools that the experimentalist might have to probe or to interrogate a system. So now let's turn to the ultimate aim of quantum thermodynamics in terms of new technologies, new engines, new devices. I see quantum thermodynamics as having a number of goals. The one is we would like to take traditional thermodynamic concepts such as work and heat and engines and efficiency and extend those beyond conventional thermodynamics to small systems, quantum systems, far from equilibrium systems and information processing systems. Also, we know that quantum phenomena can enhance information processing. For instance, quantum computers will be able to solve certain problems much more quickly than any classical computers can. Just as there are information processing tasks, such as computing, there are thermodynamic tasks, such as extracting work and powering batteries. Since quantum phenomena can enhance information processing tasks, can they similarly enhance thermodynamic tasks? So another goal is to find how quantum phenomena can enable us to achieve quantum advantages in thermodynamics similarly to information processing. And this goal actually feeds back on our studying, on our understanding of quantum theory itself. It helps us understand how quantum theory differs from classical physics. Also, we would like to identify some thermodynamic phenomena that are unique to non-classical systems. For instance, how maybe certain wave-like properties of systems evolve as a system thermalizes, exchanges energy with its surroundings. And I personally have the goal and a few of my colleagues have the goal of taking what is now fairly large and considerable toolkit of quantum thermodynamics and taking it into other disciplines such as chemistry, high energy physics, black hole physics, atomic molecular and optical physics, and using this toolkit to try to solve problems that are in these other disciplines or try to discover new problems and also to take toolkits from those disciplines home to ours. 
So I see those as the goals of quantum thermodynamics. There is also the hope that quantum thermodynamics will lead to practical technologies. Until basically now, approximately recently, quantum thermodynamics has been very foundational. So we've learned a great deal about sort of the details of the laws of thermodynamics. We've learned more and more about how thermodynamics helps us understand the separation between quantum and classical. But one might want to even more take on the spirit of conventional thermodynamics, which was coupled to the Industrial Revolution. Thermodynamics was developed because people were wondering how efficiently engines could pump water out of mines. So conventional thermodynamics was very closely coupled to the Industrial Revolution that involves this practical mindset. We might similarly hope to couple quantum thermodynamics to the second quantum revolution, in which we're using quantum systems uh, to achieve technological advantages. The community is right now undergoing something of a pivot. We're in the extremely early stages of that pivot to try to propose useful technologies. So a couple of papers from Alexia Feb have come out. I'm working with collaborators in Schalmers University in Sweden on using a quantum refrigerator to cool down qubits for quantum computing. And I do have hope that we'll find tailored applications in which quantum resources will prove even more useful than classical in certain thermodynamic tasks. Right, it sounds like the stage the community is at is coming up with proposals for how an understanding of quantum thermodynamics might be exploited to make better devices. And now you're trying to come up with experiments to test these proposals. Now we know that in certain idealized situations, sometimes quantum resources can outperform classical resources in thermodynamic tasks. And we also have confirmation, theoretically, that you can leverage quantum systems to perform tasks like refrigeration. And also experiments have been done over the past few years. So there is an increasing number of experiments that have realized quantum thermodynamic predictions and have, for instance, run very small quantum engines. And those experiments, I think, are great for proof of principle to show that these engines really can work. They're not very useful because we tend to need to invest a whole lot more energy and control in cooling down these systems so that they begin to exhibit quantum effects so that we can then use them as quantum engines, for example. And in contrast, these quantum engines put out very, very small amounts of work. So you have to exert a lot of effort to get a little bit of energy out. So that's not very helpful on a practical scale, but it is very useful in terms of advancing science. Now we need to move beyond that proof of principle stage, um, which is still ongoing, so it has not ended. There's more to be done. But collaborators and I and some other people in quantum thermodynamics are working on trying to find situations in which quantum thermodynamic technologies are actually useful and more than pay for themselves. I think of what I'm looking for in the looking for these situations as similar to looking for a place like Southern California for solar panels. If you set up solar panels in Southern California, then you don't have to pay a whole lot in order to just keep them there. And you can reap the benefits of a lot of very sunny days throughout the year. So you found just the right situation so that this particular technology that you have of a solar panel will get you a large energy benefit. If you were in the Northeast and you tried to use solar panels, then you wouldn't benefit as much and you might not even benefit at all. So similarly, I'm looking for situations in which there is an environment such that if you slot in a quantum technology, then it can actually perform quite well. I believe that collaborators and I have found such a situation for this quantum refrigerator. So quantum computers have been made from many different types of materials. One type of material that's very common, or one platform that's very common, consists of superconducting qubits, which are very small circuits in which charge can flow forever without dissipating. 
These superconductors need to be cooled to very low temperatures in order to exhibit quantum behaviors. So people have built really futuristic looking refrigerators called dilution refrigerators. They actually look extremely steampunk. They are copper or brass colored and they have all these wires sticking out. So they look wonderfully steampunk, but they just cool down superconducting qubits and the actual computer is just on a little chip inside of this large dilution refrigerator. And this dilution refrigerator is like an onion. It has many different layers, and as you go from the outer layer to the inner layer, there are successively cooler and cooler layers until you get to the very center where the superconducting qubits are, and they're coldest. So suppose that you've performed some calculation on some qubits, and you're finished. Now you need to reset the qubits. You need to take these qubits. They're storing some information. So they have some entropy, and you actually need to make them even colder. There are a number of protocols for doing this. One could engineer a quantum refrigerator that could cool these qubits down so that they are reset, so that they're fresh and clean and ready for the next computation, just by hooking up a quantum refrigerator to two of the different layers in this onion. So this onion has an inherent temperature gradient, a difference between two temperatures. And we know from thermodynamics that if you have a temperature gradient, if you have systems with two different temperatures around, and you have a machine, like an engine, then you can either extract work from the temperature difference or refrigerate, cool down a system. And so we are using two of the different layers in the onion together with a quantum refrigerator to take these used up qubits and cool them down so that they're ready for the next computation. Actually, my experimental collaborators have just been working on creating their chip. So hopefully we'll have some preliminary results soon. I'm smiling as you say this because you talk about dilution refrigerators, which create temperatures in the lab that are the coldest temperatures in the universe. And you mention in your book that your husband said that in that case, shouldn't they be called freezers? Yes, he was indignant. <laughs> so I kept referring to these because I have a number of superconducting qubit colleagues and we talk a lot. And if you're in the superconducting qubit community, then you just call them fridges for short. And so my husband said, you just call them fridges. Like they cool things down to the lowest temperatures in the universe and you can't at least call them freezers. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's a fair question. He does that a fair amount. <laughs> so now I have to ask you, what were the four most memorable advertisements you received from colleges while you were in high school? Uh, yes, this was back when I still got paper mail. So one of them came from Caltech, which I actually went to for my PhD. It was a postcard that said, do you didgeridoo? There was a person playing the didgeridoo on the front and on the back was an explanation intended to indicate we want people who are a little bit different, who do something a little bit unusual. And that was an unusual postcard, so I remembered it. One postcard came from MIT and it reminded me of physical puzzles, a, a bit like a piece of origami. It had drawings all over it and you could turn it different ways and see different parts of the drawing, the whole. Another advertisement that struck me, especially appealing to my philosophical leanings, was a letter that opened with a description of Plato's cave. Plato's cave is one of those extremely important cultural phenomena that we might learn about in class, but then really we encounter in many, many different aspects of our culture. And Plato's cave, as listeners probably know, is the story that was told by Plato, some prisoners who are chained in a cave suppose that there's a fire in the cave and a puppet master who is using puppets and the fire to cast shadows on the wall. The prisoners can see only the shadows, so they think that the world consists only of these shadows. But one prisoner escapes and runs out of the cave into the sunlight, is blinded by the sunlight, but then recovers his ability to see and sees the world outside and returns to the cave to the, tell the other prisoners. The ending isn't very happy, but I'll stop there. <laughs> I encountered this story first in a philosophy class in high school, and I was utterly taken by it, by 
how it is embedded in so many aspects of our culture. And this process of leaving the cave is part of what we go through during our high school and college experience and growing up as a whole. The fact that this college included the story of Plato's cave in an advertisement struck me. And the fourth piece of mail that I remember best from college advertisements was cute. The letter began with a fake SAT question that was something like, Jane wants to go to college and she's trying to pick a college. Which of the colleges should she pick? A, the college that she and her boyfriend are both applying to, or B, the college that's closest to home, C, the college that's farthest from home, or something like this. I thought that was a playful way of advertising. I don't know if any of the people that created any of those advertisements listen to this podcast, (laughs) but if you are out there, you should feel proud that they are still memorable. Yes. And they may have generated some new free advertising for those colleges, so well done. That's possible. (laughs) Maybe ask for a bonus. (laughs) But Nicole, what's the take-home message for your readers? The takeaway to me is that a genre of science fiction, namely steampunk, is really coming to life at this intersection of quantum physics, information science, and thermodynamics. And I think that that's just incredibly exciting. It's a very exciting field to be in. And it also has this beautiful aesthetic of steampunk. It really has an aesthetic, an a sense of art to it. I really wanted to share that with readers. Oh, if I might add one more thing. One of my favorite memories from my PhD was from that FQXI conference at which we met one afternoon. Ian and Dean Rickles, who was also co-coordinating the conference, took us to a cemetery at the University of Cambridge where we saw some tombstones of some great physicists. And then on our way back, we stopped at a pub Neil Stevenson was with us, the great novelist, because he had given the public lecture for this conference and you wanted to interview him, but didn't have anything to write on or write with. But I always bring something to write on or and something to write with. So I provided paper and a pen. And because of that, I got to sit in on your interview with Neil Stevenson. And being able to sit in on that interview with Neil Stevenson is one of my favorite memories from my PhD. Oh, well, thanks. I I shall take some credit for that. Although I imagine probably that Neil Stevenson deserves most of the credit for being naturally entertaining. (laughs) But yeah, I also remember that very well. I think I also remember what we ate because I was very hungry after a great visit to the cemetery. Yes. And then the only window of opportunity I had to interview Neil Stevenson was while we were eating. (laughs) So I was trying to scribble down his answers and he had some fantastic anecdotes about how he got into writing and, you know, his thought process and you know, what he likes to, what topics he likes to cover. And I was trying to scoff some food at the same time. Dueling priorities. Vegan sausages and mash, I recall. I was a little shy about asking him too many questions, so I was very grateful that you provided this wonderful excuse. (laughs) That is the joy of being a journalist. There are all sorts of questions you long to ask, but normally wouldn't. Yes. But now you have an excuse because, you know, in this case, I was asking for nature. Nature the journal, that is, not the term for wilderness and animals and flowers. I will put a link to that interview with Neil Stevenson for Nature on the podcast page, fqxi.org slash community slash podcast. But more importantly, I will be putting a link to Nicole Younger Halpin's quantum steampunk book there too, published by Johns Hopkins University and available to buy now. I absolutely loved it. I think our listeners probably get tired of hearing me saying that to authors on the podcast, but I suppose I only interview authors if I enjoy reading their book. I believe you. I very much appreciate it. I said earlier that when I started reading it, I thought, I wish you had just written a novel. I changed my mind as I got deeper in and I thought, I wish you had written a textbook. Because actually, I found myself remembering what it felt like to be an undergraduate excited about a class And I had an urge to start sketching engines and thermodynamic cycles. And I started to wish you had put some questions and exercises in there. Homework problems. (laughs) Which didn't happen often, actually, when I was a student, that I'd actually want those things. But, you know, in the cases where you do have a really good class and a really good teacher, you, you really get into the topic. 
So now I have two requests that you go off and write both a novel and a textbook. <laughs> I guess the fact that I have these two conflicting wishes means that you got the balance just right. I hope so. I will do my best on them. <laughs> so thank you, Nicole, for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me on the podcast. Before I go, since we mentioned both Ian Durham, whom our listeners know and love from the end of year review, and college applications, I wanted to let you know that Ian is organising a summer school for high school students at St Anselm College in New Hampshire. So if you or anyone you know might be interested in studying astronomy or physics at university one day, it's worth checking that out. For more information, reach out to Ian Durham directly by email at idurham at onsom.edu. That's I-D-U-R-H-A-M at A-N-S-E-L-M dot E-D-U. Or you can find Ian on Twitter at Quantum Moxie. That's all for today. As always, you can reach us by email at podcast.fqxi.org or on Twitter at FQXI. And you can find us on Facebook, Instagram and Pinterest at FQXI Physics. Thank you for listening. I've been Zia Morali. <laughs>